We're coming on the air with the unpredictable weather coast to coast tonight as we're just getting an update from the National Hurricane Center about that tropical storm getting stronger as we speak. In fact, expected to turn into a hurricane tonight. Forecasters think it could hit west of New Orleans less than 48 hours from now. Plus, out west, wildfires that could literally go in any direction. We're on the ground, on the scene, live. We're also following a big update out of Idaho. A judge moving the trial of an accused serial killer convinced by arguments that it couldn't be fair. So what does this mean for the fight for justice? Then, preparing for the first and maybe only face-off between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Trump, our newsmaker and former top aide to President Bill Clinton, James Carville, giving his take on what the VP should do. Then, the backstory on an NBC News exclusive, how our reporter got the founder of the disastrous Fire Festival sits to sit down, and tell her how Fire Festival Part 2 could maybe actually work. And in tonight's original, the family that inspired succession with their own legal battle, the inside look at the fight to take over the Murdoch media empire later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're starting tonight with a split screen of intense and dangerous weather with fires burning out of control in the West and that Hurricane Center update dropping on the newly formed tropical storm strengthening and taking aim at the South. Francine expected to become a hurricane tonight. We're just getting word of this as out West, you've got this massive, look at this, line fire burning east of L.A. Only 3% contained right now. Some 20,000 acres are up in smoke. And this thing's threatening more than 30,000 homes. Schools are already shut down. Three firefighters are already hurt. And the challenge here, they just can't predict where the fire is going to go next. Some 11,000 people are under evacuation orders, with one couple telling NBC they just landed back at LAX after a trip. They're racing to get home. Watch. We hightailed it here as fast as we can, and now they've got the access point closed off. So we're really worried. We have to get our pets. We have to get medicines. Family member. I want to show you some of these buildings going up in flames north of San Francisco in the Boyles fire, where thousands there have also been forced to leave. Just two of some 70 big fires burning across 11 states. Then down south, Louisiana and parts of Texas are bracing for Tropical Storm Francine, which is getting stronger faster in the Gulf of Mexico. At least one school system is shutting down in Louisiana, with evacuation orders being put in place into other parts of the state. NBC's Steve Patterson and Bill Cairns are both joining us here. We'll get to Bill with the forecast in just a second. But Steve, I want to start with you in California with these wildfires. They have exploded in size, affecting tens of thousands of people in your state. Yeah, and it is way too hot outside to even be standing outside, number one, but to be fighting a fire, impossibly hot to imagine what firefighters up there behind me you see in the mountains are going through. Smoke has just enveloped this canyon area that we're in right now. That is because this is not a wind-driven fire. So many of these fires that we report to you, Hallie, are driven by strong red flag winds pushing into other communities, chewing up vegetation faster than firefighters can find it. That is not the case with this. This is is essentially just settled down in one spot, makes the air quality here horrendous, like it is hard to talk, it's hard to breathe, you can feel it in your eyes, your nose, really everywhere. And that's why air quality warnings are going out to communities that are dozens of miles away. But the worst part is what's happening in the mountains behind me, because this fire got so hot so quickly, maybe tripling, maybe even quadrupling in size over the weekend to where it is now, that it's formed its own weather system. There were pyrocumulus clouds in the air with thousands of lightning strikes. The National Weather Service actually Actually recorded close to 4,000 lightning strikes. That, of course, affects the firefighting ability. And not only that, that system has made things so erratic, even despite the wind, that firefighters weren't sure what direction the fire was going to move. They thought it may be moving in up to three directions. All of those directions have communities with homes. It's why we're saying that 35,000 homes are at risk as we speak. Despite that, firefighters doing a great job of protection. Not one of those homes we've heard of so far has burned. No one has died. Three firefighters, of course, injured fighting this fire because it is so erratic. The terrain is so steep. It is so difficult to battle, but it doesn't appear like this fire is moving very quickly, which is good news yeah. for firefighters who are doing all they can. Yet again, though, 100, 101 degrees here. Allie? Just about to ask you what's next then, right, where this goes, because it seems like with this yeah. heat, it, it is just going to be status quo for a little bit, and that could be very dangerous. 
So firefighters need resources, and it sounds like they're getting them. Obviously, state of emergency activated here earlier today. We're hearing now that the governor has activated the National Guard. The National Guard sort of activates as a support service, so they'll do air support, ground support, security support, so policing on the ground. That frees up actual people that need to go and fight the fire, so just more manpower cycling in. We're also hearing a little bit higher humidity, a little bit lower in temperature, and then, again, continued no wins means firefighters can hopefully put more protection on this thing and get it out before it causes any worse disasters than it already is. Allie. Steve Patterson live for us there in Mentone, California. Thank you. We also talked about that split screen with the weather. Let me take you down south because there's a tropical storm that is getting bigger, faster in the Gulf of Mexico. And by tonight, we may not be calling it tropical storm Francine anymore, but hurricane Francine. It comes after a pretty rare quiet period. Bill Karen's just got the latest update from the National Hurricane Center. Bill, not even, what, four minutes ago, I should say. Talk us through it. What do we know? Uh, 48 hours to go. Um, and then we'll expect the hurricane to be moving into Louisiana. And poor Louisiana. It's been like a magnet. I think we had like three storms in 2020 and like two in 2021. One since then. I mean, Louisiana has been gotten hit more than anyone lately. And this one's heading your way. So now it's up to 65 mile per hour winds. It has strengthened considerably, getting more organized. And now the Hurricane Center has it becoming a strong Category 2 by the time it gets towards the Louisiana coast. Now, there's a couple things with this. One, the weaker side of this, it won't even be much rain in Texas and it won't even be that windy. It's a glancing blow like large waves rip currents. That'll be the biggest danger. But from the Houston area to Corpus Christi, you look like you're gonna be doing OK with this one. But it's from the Beaumont Port Arthur to Lake Charles area. And then as we go through central Louisiana, we're talking Baton Rouge, Lafayette. And then New Orleans now is out of the cone. You're on the fur furthest east side. You're going to have to deal with probably some strong you know, squalls going through, maybe some tornadoes. But that looks to be the worst of it and heavy rainfall, too, for New Orleans, not the direct hit from the storm. Then we bring the storm right up the Mississippi River Valley and rain it out over the top of Memphis. So we shouldn't have too many problems. I don't think it will weaken significantly. But we now have hurricane warnings. Coastal Louisiana, Cameron Parish here heading towards Vermilion Bay. That's this area. Also Beaumont and Lake Charles and poor Lake Charles. I and mean, poor Lake Charles got devastated by a hurricane a couple of years ago. And this one looks to be just east of you. But again, you're in that cone. So we have to watch it closely. There's the storm surge map. Five to ten feet's no joke. Even though this is a relatively unpopulated coast, this is not beach. This is marsh. This is swamp swampy areas, but that water will push pretty far inland, so we could even see some evacuations further inland. And then, of course, everyone's wondering, will my house get the eye, get that wind damage that we're going to deal with? We won't be able to pin that down yet. That'll come in the days to come. But when you see rainfall totals up to 12 inches, and it poured last week in Louisiana, rivers are already full, there's water everywhere, and then we're going to put this on top of it. So we're going to have a lot of water issues from the rainfall alone. And because we already talked about this, and we saw with Steve, it's still brutally hot in areas of the southwest. Now, now, coastal L.A. is all right. Once you go inland by about four miles, it jumps to 100 degrees. It's 101 in Vegas. Phoenix is 106. They're sick of it. Everyone's done with it. We've seen the firefighters out there in this. It's just, you know, one more day. That's all I have to say. And then you get your relief. So excessive heat warnings for L.A. till tomorrow. And then we will cool it off. So 111 in the Palm Springs. And then, Hallie. 70s and 80s returns by the middle of the week. But all eyes on this hurricane. This will be our definitely yeah. our, you know, probably our most significant threat as we go throughout uh, Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening. Plenty to watch for you, Bill. Thank you. Yeah. We'll have you back, I know, as things develop. Yeah. Appreciate it. We're also learning tonight that the fugitive suspect accused of opening fire near a Kentucky highway had texted somebody just a half hour before saying he intended to, I'm quoting here, kill a lot of people. These chilling details are coming in an affidavit for an arrest warrant obtained by NBC News. As officials look for that gunman, they are asking him to surrender. Watch. If, if he does have social media, if he does have a family out there that cares for him, you know, turn yourself in. Don't make this worse than what it is. Police say this 32-year-old fired apparently randomly at oncoming traffic. Just cars driving down the highway on this stretch of I-75 between Lexington and Knoxville, Tennessee, on Saturday, hitting a number of cars, seriously hurting five people. Adrian Broaddus is joining us now. So you've had this urgent manhunt going on for something like 36 hours from now. Where does it stand? Do police think they have some kind of a lead on this guy? 
Hallie, they are still searching. Investigators are using drones, helicopters, and dogs to search a wooded area about eight miles from where we are. But those court documents we received earlier from deputies here with the Laurel County Sheriff's Department are shedding light on what happened leading up to the shooting. According to this affidavit, Joseph Couch sent a text message to a woman about 30 minutes before the shooting unfolded. According to that woman, she tried to warn authorities. In that text that he allegedly sent her, he also said, not only did he say, I'll kill myself afterwards, but he said, I'm going to kill a lot of people. Well, try at least. We've also learned he does have a military background, serving, according to state police, about four years with the U.S. Army Reserve. And they also told us he received an honorable discharge. Here's the other thing. The same day of the shooting, which happened on Saturday, is when investigators believe he purchased that AR-15. That's the weapon they found near the crime scene. Not only did he purchase that gun, but he also bought, according to investigators, about 100, or excuse me, 1,000 rounds of ammunition. Adrian brought us live for us there in London, Kentucky. Thank you very much. To Idaho now, where tonight a judge in that state is moving the trial of an accused serial killer after his defense team argued there's no way he'll get a fair trial in the small town where these murders happened. Remember, he's accused of killing four students at the University of Idaho back in November of 2022. The victims, you see them here. Kaylee Goncalves, Madison Mogan, Ethan Chapin, Zana Kernodal found stabbed to death. It was a stunning crime. You probably remember the wall-to-wall -wall media coverage, a six-week manhunt for whoever did it, a lot of speculation online, and then, of course, the arrest of this man, Brian Koberger. His lawyers filed a motion to change venue that basically means they wanted to move the trial out of Moscow to somewhere else. They argue that all that coverage means that it's going to be harder to find a pool of impartial jurors in this county where the crime happened, and today... The judge agreed with that, calling this the most difficult decision of his career. I want to bring in Morgan Chesky, who's been following all of this. It is also in part two because of the resources, essentially, right? The judge made the argument that, listen, this is going to get a lot of attention. This is going to be a blockbuster trial. And the, the sheriff, et cetera, the security apparatus in this town simply might not be equipped to handle that kind of influx. Yeah, Hallie, definitely not equipped, and that was detailed in this decision that we received from the judge earlier today following that hearing that lasted the better part of a day about two weeks ago. Uh, the judge simply stating what he believes is a clear-cut fact, and that is in this small town of Moscow, Idaho, to have a trial of this magnitude with the national eyeballs on it that it's received since it began and that it will definitely receive once that trial goes underway, he says they would need more security, more court clerks, more essentially of everything. Uh, that was one of the contributing factors, he says, led him to issue this change of venue from that tight-knit community there where this horrific tragedy took place. Uh, another thing he brought up here, Hallie, that I think is important to note is the fact that he pointed to surveys conducted by some witnesses on behalf of the defense that pointed out the preconceived notions that people in these counties had regarding Brian Koberger, the accused, we have Latah County, where Moscow is located. 67% of respondents, Tally, believed he was guilty. 24% said definitely guilty. You go south to Ada County, where Boise is located. Of course, the capital of Idaho there, much larger city with more resources. Still, 68% believe Koberger is guilty. 22% believe definitely guilty. All of that contributing to the decision to not have this trial play out uh, in Moscow, although we still don't know where it, it could be handled here. Well, could it be Boise? And I only ask that because there's another high-profile trial uh, in Idaho that we covered here on the show. Um, of course, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, that I think ended up moved to Boise, right? Right. That is exactly the case. It certainly could be Boise. That's what the defense is suggesting, saying that there's a larger pool of jurors to draw from there that could potentially be uh, unbiased as it relates to whether their stance uh, is covert or innocent or guilty. Uh, although I should point out, the judge pointing to this survey that led them out of Moscow, but even in Ada County, as we mentioned again, Hallie, 68% of respondents there say that he's guilty. And I do want to share with you uh, a family statement from Kaylee Gonzalez, one of the four victims uh, in this murder. They said regarding the judge changing venues, 
The only good thing about this decision is that it's the judge's last decision on this case. Pretty clear there. Hallie? Yeah, Morgan Chesky, uh, thank you very much for that update. Appreciate it. In less than 30 minutes from now, we're expecting to see Vice President Kamala Harris land on the tarmac in Philly. We saw her board Air Force Two over in Pittsburgh. Of course, she's heading there to Philadelphia, as will former President Trump likely tomorrow for that first debate between these two. And we are getting new details on this last minute debate prep push for both campaigns. It could be one of the most consequential moments in this race, certainly the highest profile moment of this particular campaign so far, with both camps saying that they're holding these extensive prep sessions in the final run up. They do call it a little bit of a different thing, right? Prep, non-prep, prep, we're going to get into that in a second, because, you know, former President Trump says he usually steers clear of more formal practice sessions. There's also some new polling out now showing that this race is neck and neck. It is super competitive inside the, var the margin of error nationally among likely voters, very much so. Same deal goes in these critical Rust Belt battlegrounds. Aaron Gilchrist is in Pittsburgh for us tonight. Aaron, let's start with the Harris camp first. One thing that we keep hearing uh, from her people is that Donald Trump, in their view, uses the same old playbook in his attacks. Um, there is an opportunity here for Kamala Harris to be on the national stage in a way that even with the convention, you look at the debate numbers, twice as many viewers watch the first debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden as they did the Democratic National Convention. It's a real opportunity for her to, to make the case against him and one that he will be ready for. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and there are a couple of different things I think that she's been preparing for in these mock debate sessions over the last five days here in Pittsburgh. One, uh, obviously, is dealing with Donald Trump. You talk about uh, her reference to him using the play same old playbook. We've heard her say that on the campaign trail uh, over the last uh, several weeks. And I think that's really her making a reference to uh, his penchant for uh, insults and for threats and for, as the campaign has said, lies. I want you to hear a little bit about a little bit of what the vice president had to say about that issue uh, on a radio show. She recorded uh, a conversation with Ricky Smiley, a radio show host and comedian a couple of uh, days ago. Listen. I mean, he um, he plays for this really old and tired playbook, right, where he there's no floor for him in terms of how low he will go and um and we should be prepared for that we should be prepared for the fact that he is not burdened by telling the truth um and we should be prepared for the fact that he is probably going to speak a lot of untruth and so the other part of the preparation here, Hallie, I think for the vice president, uh, according to sources anyways, is, is this idea that she needs to be able to answer policy-related questions uh, in a way that she can tie in facts and figures with uh, a narrative format that uh, people at home who are watching will be able to, to grasp and actually hold on to and find some substance in. Uh, she doesn't want to get too buried in the weeds after so many days of preparation, concentrated preparation here. There was some concern from at least one source who spoke to our team that she would be over-prepared uh, and not be able to sort of talk about how uh, her ideas around lowering costs for families and, and helping small businesses uh, fit into her personal story and fit into their lives as well, Hallie. There's also, of course, the issue of foreign policy that we know will come up. We know that former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard has been working with former President Trump uh, on that, on that side of things. Uh, and, and you've got this new House Republican report that is out today, this long-awaited report on what they see as the failures of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, a withdrawal, of course, that former President Trump initiated while he was in office. It certainly, however, may be something that comes up for Vice President Harris tomorrow from former President Trump. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We know that uh, as a part of the debate preparation here, she's been poring over these briefing books that her team has prepared for her. And now this report is out, uh, even though the White House has said that this is a report that seems as though uh, facts have been cherry picked. I think that was the phrasing that the White House used. This is still something that moderators might ask uh, the vice president about and something that Donald Trump might bring up in his uh, uh, responses to questions, pointing the finger at uh, the vice president. And so she'll have to be prepared to answer both uh, for her part in the decision-making process, and she'll have to be, t to some degree, answer for the decisions that ultimately were President Biden's, but uh, you know, at least in, in one case she said that she was the last person in the room as yeah. some of those decisions were being made, and so she'll be taking the task on those things, and we'll, we'll see how she responds to that, knowing that that's a part of, that was a part of the preparation, answering these policy questions, a part of the preparation that she did here in Pittsburgh. Aaron Gilchrist, live for us there in Pittsburgh. Aaron, thank you. Von Hilliard is joining me here in New York, where we are getting ready, of course,
matters for debate. Uh, big debate night tomorrow. Lots of special coverage with uh, sort of the political universe moving down to Philadelphia tomorrow night. Former President Trump has been prepping at his home in South Florida. And I say the word prepping not lightly because they often say, listen, and we hear this from allies. I know you hear it. He does interviews. He takes tough questions. That's basically his prep. He's actually doing some policy sessions with allies, right? Right. And that was the posture back in June ahead of the Joe Biden debate sure. that he does rallies. But for a long time, it's been like that. Exactly. Donald Trump, they say Donald Trump doesn't sit and do mock debates. He would never do a 90 minute session. And that's where the acknowledgement that he's actually doing some debate prep for this one is notable. He did that yesterday at Mar-a-Lago. We were told that he was going to be doing a few sessions here today before making his way to Philadelphia. And let's be very clear, right? Kamala Harris, back in 2019, when she was running for president herself, she had a visualization of what it would be debate Donald Trump, right? She said she couldn't wait for the day that she got to prosecute the case toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with Donald Trump. But for the Republican nominee, this really didn't come into focus until about two months ago mm -hmm. when Kamala Harris took over the top of the ticket. I'm told by a top advisor to Donald Trump that he has really been focused in during this debate prep on two parts of it. Number one, making the case of the American electorate that Kamala Harris was not, in this advisor's words, complicit uh, or was complicit over the last three and a half years for all the actions and decisions that were made by the Biden, Biden administration, that she wasn't just some bystander and was not responsible for any of the foreign policy, economic decision making. They're looking to lash her to his record. Exactly. And then the second part I'm told is that they were preparing for what they expect to be right one liners or quick quips from Kamala Harris and how she may respond to Trump and how he could then turn it back towards her, knowing that she will be eager and prepared over these two hours. So what's the thing that you're going to be looking for, Vaughn, is you're going to be watching this like the rest of us looking to see this incredibly high profile moment. We don't know if there's going to be a second debate. We think maybe it's not clear. What's your sense? I think my question is, to what extent is Donald Trump cornered into answering policy specifics mm. or even justifying his actions around the January 6th attack or about any of the underlying claims and allegations that were made of over any of the indictments? Because that's two months ago what we were anticipating before the Joe Biden debate. But Democrats were frustrated because they felt like Joe Biden missed the opportunity with the American electorate watching to hold him accountable, they said, for some of Donald Trump's own past actions and words. And now the question here is, will Kamala Harris try to force him? We saw this in a, in a sort of a jumble mumbled response to child care policy from Donald mm -hmm. Trump last week when he actually is held to feet to the fire on some policy specifics. Will he deliver in over these last 48 hours of debate prep as he worked to you know polish some of these policy positions here with the millions of Americans that are going to be watching and ultimately going to hold his own fate, his own future of 2025 in their hands? Vaughn Hilliard, thank you very much. We'll Thanks, be talking more, I know, in the day to come. It's good to see you. Tune in tomorrow night, obviously, when Kamala Harris and Donald Trump face off. You can watch all of the coverage starting right here on NBC News Now, starting really at 4 p.m. Eastern if you want to pregame super hard. Otherwise, we'll see you at 8 o'clock on the network and right here on streaming. We'll see you then. The Justice Department also tonight just unsealing a 15-count indictment naming two people in connection with a plot to target Jewish people, black people, members of the LGBTQ plus community, along with others. Prosecutors say this effort was intended to start a race war, they say, to bring down the U.S. government. The two alleged white supremacists are also accused of making a so-called kill list of federal officials. The indictment also accuses them of inciting successful terror attacks in Slovakia and Turkey and a plot that was foiled ultimately in New Jersey. We're going to be following this story closely. We'll bring you any new developments. Also tonight, we're taking you to Miami, where the police union there is blaming an NFL superstar for an incident that forced one officer onto administrative duties. You know we're talking about Tyreek Hill, the Miami Dolphins wide receiver. This is the video of him on the ground just before the season opener, less than 24 hours ago. He ended up getting cuffed just steps from the stadium right before that game against the Jaguars. Well, now police have not yet released the body cam footage of the incident, but the head of the Miami-Dade Police Department tells the Miami Herald that video is part of the reason why the officer is off the streets for now. Marissa Parra is in Miami for us. And Marissa, if it's giving some sort of shades of Scotty Shuffler for people, that's because it does feel kind of similar here. And now, 24 hours after police promised transparency, there's a question of what that actually looks like and what really happened here and why.
A big question, Hallie, and of course, one that only time will tell. A lot of people wanting to see that video for understandable reasons, but uh, Miami-Dade police saying, quote, at the time, there is an open slash active internal affairs investigation on the matter. Therefore, no additional information can be released. But they did say once the investigation concludes, Hallie, they said, quote, we will be able to fulfill all public records requests. So we will have to see about that one. But we also are hearing from the South Florida Police Benevolent Association, which is one that says they are a voice for law enforcement. They maintain in their statement, quote, upon being stopped, Hill was not immediately cooperative with the officers on scene. And they continue that it is pursuant to policy why they placed Hill in handcuffs. They continue that Hill, quote, refused to sit on the ground and was therefore redirected to the ground. Once the situation was sorted out within a few minutes, Mr. Hill was issued two traffic citations and was free to leave. And Hallie, as you mentioned, one of those officers is on administrative duties during this investigation. And Hallie, I'll conclude, among the people we're hearing from this Miami-Dade mayor who is calling all of this troubling. Marissa, one of the things that we saw in the field, I should say, on the field from Hill, he ended up uh, with the touchdown in that game, there was that sort of m celebratory moment where it looked like a, a, a teammate was doing like a handcuff motion off the field. However, he ended up speaking publicly. Uh, talk us through that piece of it. He did. And in short, I think the, the two major headlines that I took away from that is he said, one, um, he's unsure of what he did to warrant being put in handcuffs to begin with. He said he was not being disrespectful. His mother didn't raise him that way. But he also added he was even more unsure what could have happened if he wasn't the football star that he is right now. I mean, one of the reasons that someone took out their phone to record this and furthermore that this video even ended up going viral is because of the football star that he is. So in this, you know, interview, this this moment on camera that you see afterwards that you're going to hear in just a moment, he's expressing doubt. He's expressing doubt about what this could have looked like if it wasn't him that this happened to. Take a listen to I don't want to bring it race into it, but sometimes it gets kind of iffy when you do. You feel me? So what if I wasn't Tyreek Hill? Lord knows, like, what that guy or guys would have did. You feel me? He did end up having a good night on the field, though. Hallie had over 100 yards. He scored a touchdown. So he himself seems to have been able to shake this off in the moment. But a lot of questions still lingering as this yeah. investigation just starts. Marissa Parra, thank you very much. A lot more to get to here on the show, including Bruce Springsteen's wife revealing she's sick. New details on her diagnosis in just a second. Plus, Beyonce, Cowboy Carter, shut out of the CMAs. Are you surprised? We'll tell you whether her fans are. And the conversation the whole thing's sparking about black artists and country music all together next. Princess Kate, Kate Middleton, says she has now completed tough chemo treatments. Remember, that's after she revealed she was being treated for cancer back in March. Take a look at this. The Princess of Wales now saying she's going to pick up a light schedule through the end of the year, sharing this all in a produced video message. Take a look at some of it. Although I have finished chemotherapy, my path to healing and full recovery is long, and I must continue to take each day as it comes. I am, however, looking forward to being back at work and undertaking a few more public engagements in the coming months when I can. Despite all that's gone before, I enter this new phase of recovery with a renewed sense of hope and appreciation of life. Still TBD on what those public engagements will be. Also tonight, a CMA snub, country music snub that is getting a lot of attention because Beyonce and Cowboy Carter Nowhere on the list. Zero nominations for Queen Bee, even with that huge mega hit, Texas Hold'em, topping the country charts. Remember, it was the first song by a black female artist to be on the top of the Billboard's Hot Country Songs chart when it came out months ago. However, she is still getting praise from at least one actual nominee, Shibuzi, featured on two tracks on Cowboy Carter and who ended up with two nominations of his own. Posting on X, thank you, Beyonce, for opening a door for us, starting a conversation, and giving us one of the most innovative country albums of all time. If you're like, okay, well, wait a second. Why do I think about, like, the CMAs and Beyonce? Was that? Yes, it's because back in 2016, remember, when there was this sort of chilly reception for Beyonce when she appeared with the chicks? 
She has suggested that that is what inspired her to create Cowboy Carter in the first place. Chloe Malas is joining us now. Huge album. Monster album. Second biggest opening of the year. Was on top of the charts for two weeks. It wasn't necessarily the country radio stations that were pushing it. She was getting tons of play on streaming. And that is what really helped catch momentum around Cowboy Carter. Now the CMAs are out. No nomination, which I think to some of her fans feels pretty tone deaf. I mean, if you go and you look on social media right now, there's complete outrage. As you may know, uh, fans of Beyonce are called the Bayhive. And if you go on and you look, they are saying this is ridiculous. She was shut out, criticizing the CMAs. I mean, when you look at who is the voting body of the Country Music Awards, it's really, it's past winners. It's country music stars themselves, people in the industry, right? And so it's obviously a ma massive snub. But I just want to point out that when Beyonce put this out, album out in the first place. She said, this is not a country That's album. Right. That's right. But her she fans, said it's a Beyonce album. And her fans pushed it to the top of the charts. They even petitioned Apple to change the designation of the songs from pop to country. And it did become a country uh, smash hit. And if you look at Shibuzi and the doors that she opened, he was on two songs off of that album, right? But if you look at the history of the CMAs, this is not the first time. I want to point out Lil Nas X mm -hmm. completely shut out when he had Old Town Road from all nominations except for the category where he was nominated along with Billy Ray Cyrus, basically saying you are successful because of Billy Ray Cyrus. Look at Tracy Chapman. Last year, the first black woman in history to win CMA's Song of the Year for her hit single, Fast Car, and that was because Luke Combs he put it back on the map. Did that cover, yeah. So you might say, does the CMA have an issue with female black artists? And that is the question that people are asking today. And that is so much a part of the conversation more broadly here around this, uh, the role of black artists in country music, because you mentioned Shibuzi, somebody who, you know, obviously not Beyonce, was on the album, did end up getting a couple of nominations. And, and part of this too, right, is about elevating some of those voices that you put on the album in this genre. So Shibuzi is nominated. Morgan Wallen, though, who has had issues in the past, he's gotten, uh, you know, criticism and in trouble for using racial slurs, right? So he is leading the pack this year for the most nominations. Um, and then you also have Chris Stapleton, you have Cody Johnson, uh, you have Lainey Wilson, who's a rising star in country music. But fans are saying, you are not listening to the people. It's like when you go to the Oscars, it's not exactly the same, but let me just say this. It's like when you watch the Oscars and it's all the movies you saw that year weren't nominated. <laughs> and you're like, where's the Marvel and movie? Where are What's the up? movies that people yeah. are really watching? Yeah. People were listening to Beyonce. People embrace Beyonce. Even country music listeners embrace Beyonce. Why was she not nominated? Chloe Malas, thank you very much for that. Interesting uh, CMA snub there. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, students in a Georgia county will head back to class tomorrow, one week after the deadliest school shooting in more than a year. It ended in the deaths of two students and two teachers. That comes as a Washington Post revo report reveals the mother of the 14-year-old gunman called the school that morning, the suspect, warning of a, quote, extreme emergency, asking them to check in on her son. We're gonna have more on this story next hour. Number two, Bruce Springsteen's wife, who's also his bandmate, has a form of blood cancer she's sharing today. In a new documentary, she reveals she was diagnosed back in 2018 and that the illness has made it difficult for her to perform. Number three, Selena Gomez says she's not going to be able to carry a baby because of health problems that would put her and the baby at risk. She did not say exactly what those health complications would be. Gomez had a kidney transplant a few years ago and went through chemo for lupus. Number four, in just the last few hours, Apple rolling out the iPhone 16, its first model designed around AI. Apple intelligence is what they call it. They say it's going to make Siri better. It's going to create custom emojis really, really fast. The new phones are going to come out in stores later this month. Number five, Pope Francis arriving in East Timor today, where most of the people there are Catholic. It's a three-day stop as he's been traveling around the Asia Pacific. Tens, look at this, tens of thousands of people showing up to see the Pope. This is one of the poorest countries in the world. The church there has recently dealt with abuse scandals. More than half a million people could come to the Pope's open-air mass tomorrow. Remember, he's been dealing with health issues. This is a significantly long trip for him. When we come back... A governor saving a man with a lobster stuck in his throat. You might be surprised at what happens right after this moment we're about to show you. There it is. We'll be right back.
NBC covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, more than two dozen people are hurt after a 73-year-old man drove into a building in Arizona. Police say alcohol was a factor in the crash. You're seeing some of the aftermath here. The driver is now in custody. Out of our Southern Bureau, a federal trial is starting today over claims that supporters of former President Trump threatened and harassed a Biden-Harris campaign bus in Texas back in 2020. Do you remember this moment? Made a lot of news at the time. You can see the so-called Trump train drivers here. The plaintiff's attorneys say this was an orchestrated attack meant to intimidate the people on the bus, something that forced the campaign to cancel its remaining events in that state. The defense claims the drivers joined the train as if it were a pep rally. It's a story we'll follow. And out of our Northeast Bureau, New Hampshire's governor, you have got to see this. Helping to save a man choking on a lobster roll during an eating competition. So this guy, do you see him? He's got the hat on there. Here comes Governor Sununu. Helps him out when this guy starts choking. He starts tapping his chest. Nobody apparently noticed at first, according to the governor. You can see him there. He had downed about, I think, something like uh, two rolls. So comes in, gives him that maneuver. First responders took over. Incredibly, the guy fully recovers and goes back to the eating competition. He eats seven more lobster rolls, telling our affiliate WMUR they went right down the gullet. It's a good thing he's okay. Chris Sununu, man, that's quite the moment. Speaking of moments in politics, let's talk about the one that's going to happen tomorrow night, of course. Debate prep. And the debate stage for Vice President Harris and former President Trump, they are in those critical final hours now getting ready, finding that balance between preparing and not over-preparing. It could put more eyeballs on these two than any other moment leading up to the November election. So for VP Harris, it's an opportunity for her to lay out her policy positions, to potentially go after former President Trump for some of his. At not just for her as President Biden's replacement on the Democratic ticket, but as the person best suited to take his job. For former President Trump, it's vice versa. Let me bring in Democratic strategist and co-host of the Politics War Room podcast, James Carville. We are so glad to have you on the show. Thank you for doing it. We're, we're, we're thrilled you're joining us. Very good. Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, the timing's interesting because we were reading your op-ed in The New York Times that lays out a few key steps for the vice president that you think she'll need to do to defeat the former president. And one of them well, is essentially to let Donald Trump be Donald Trump tomorrow. So how does she do that without letting him steamroll? Or is that part of the point? Well, I don't think he's going to be able to steamroll. I mean, it, 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 the, the term, the negotiations are pretty specific, and she can point to that, and the, the host got there. I actually... I, I hate to say this because you're not supposed to say it. I think Trump is walking into a giant trap. Okay, why? I, if I was campaign, I think she's well prepared. She's been in Pittsburgh. She's got really top people preparing her. She's going to have low expectations because the President Biden did so horribly in June. It wasn't that Trump did great. It was that President Biden didn't do very well at all. And I, I, I hate to say this, I could be eating my words uh on Wednesday, but I think she's going to do quite well, and I think he made a big mistake by accepting this debate. Well, I really do. Okay. Clip and save this, and we'll find out on Wednesday morning or yeah. tomorrow night. Yeah. Yeah. You can laugh at me. I'm going to fool myself, but well, that's no, okay. But, but let me ask you this, James. You, you say she's well prepared. She, she has do. been holed up in Pittsburgh since Thursday getting ready for this. Do you worry that there is a risk of over-preparation? We've seen that with some candidates before. Are you concerned that she could be over-prepping? Well, for somebody I never studied very hard, I, I don't know that I over prep anything. I just kind of go in and wing it. No, I'm not too worried about that. I think they're practicing their timing. I think she has four or five like lines that she keeps in her back pocket that she can use regardless of what he comes up with. She's actually a, an experienced uh, lawyer, uh, trial attorney, prosecutor, and he's not that good. He's not that great, and mm. she has great opportunity because he has 100% knowledge. People know who she is. They don't know what she is, I pointed out, in the piece. And I think she can fill out a, a pretty good picture of who she is and what she stands for. I, mm. I think the upside for her is really is okay. much bigger than 
upside for him. You talked about maybe there's some lines in her back pocket. You know a thing or two about lines. That The one that comes up for me, of course, is the phrase, it's the economy, stupid, that you are, of course, one of the architects of is when you were working with former President Clinton um, back in the, the early 90s. Um, when you talk about the economy, when you look at this issue that you know is so critical to so many Americans around the country, they tell us that again and again in polls and in person. How does she try to close the gap between where the numbers are and the way that people feel in what a lot of experts have termed the vibe session, if you will? Well, first of all, the, the gap is close. A lot of it was just because they thought that President Biden was in you know, old in control of things. Last time I saw a poll, it was, it was pretty, you know, within single digits. Uh, views in the economy are not static. Uh, there'll be a rate cut. I think she can talk about, you know, some of the things she's talking about, different kind of capital gains tax. And she can also uh, contrast his tariffs, which never work, you know, to, to what she wants to do. I, I don't think she has to cede that ground to him at all. And the truth of the matter is, and I keep asking people, well, what's the evidence that the economy was in, under the first three years of Trump was any better than the last year of President Obama? I don't, I don't know of any. No one's been able to show anything to me about that. But uh, she'll, she'll be able to do just fine on that, and I okay. guarantee you she's ready for it. I promise you. She's well, really ready. Speaking of people who are who are ready for it, what's been interesting is our team's new reporting that suggests former President Trump is doing maybe more of these so-called policy sessions to get ready for tomorrow night. That's a bit of a shift. You know that his campaign has long said that he doesn't really do prep. He does interviews. He takes questions. That's kind of how he gets ready. What is this apparent shift or at least the 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 making public of the prep session say to you about where the former president's head may be at as he prepares for this face-off against Vice President Harris? Well, I think he has donors and supporters mm. about, about all but the, the higher end ones are kind of scared, and they should be scared. And they're trying to reassure people, oh, no, he, he, he's in prep, he, he's studying policies. Of course, he's doing no such thing. And I... I I, I continue to believe that he's going to walk right into a giant sawmill okay. tomorrow. Let and, me ask. But I'm sorry, James. Yeah. I didn't mean to step on you. I mean, I love a Zoom, but I hate it too. I wanted to get in a quick question to you about the new documentary coming out because I'm interested to watch it this fall about the raising of alarms of President Biden's candidacy. And you specifically, as one of the people who came out early, you came out vociferously, I would say. Um, uh, raising some of those alarm bells, sounding some of those alarm bells. What kind of lasting impact, if any, do you think that that whole situation is going to have on the party, not just this cycle, but in the years to come? Well, look, I think President Biden made a wise decision. And I think the party has completely moved on for that. I, I, I really don't I think historically it, it's going to be viewed that the Democratic Party came to the correct decision late in the cycle, but I don't see much lasting damage from it. Uh, I would certainly rather be remembered for other things over my career than this, but uh, I understand that some people ask me about it, but no one's mad at me anymore. But okay. I was in Chicago at the convention, and people are uh, upbeat, and right. I think they're to be upbeat, you know? I'm, I've done a lot of things in my life. That's just one of them. I hope it doesn't stand out above other things. But I think the film will be pretty good on that. Right. I know it will. <laughs> James Carville, no longer persona non grata inside the Democratic Party, apparently. Thank you very much for being with us, sir. Well, really you, appreciate really awesome. your time. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. So listen, yeah. coming up, we've got answers to the thing that I know has been keeping you up every single night this week. Where is Fire Festival 2 going to be? And when? And how much is it going to cost me? Well, good thing our Savannah Sellers got an exclusive interview with the man now out of prison behind the whole thing. You're not going to want to miss it. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, it's an interview you will only see right here on NBC News on one of the most infamous scams of this current century the one involving the leaky FEMA tents, the depressing cheese sandwiches. That's right, the fire Festival. Because if you've been watching this show, you know it's back. At least the guy who went to prison for fraud over the whole thing says it's back, and he's hoping to sell tickets for, you know, whatever it's going to be. Billy McFarlane himself is now getting specific, like a little more specific, about Firefest the sequel in a broadcast exclusive with our Savannah Sellers. Okay, so when is it going to be? He says April of next year. How much is it going to cost you? 
anywhere from $1,400 to more than a million. <clears throat> Where is it going to be? A private island, apparently, this time off the coast of Mexico. Who's going to be there? Well, no big name talent yet, but McFarland is promising. He says things are going to go smoothly this time. How will you guarantee the safety of guests? Mm -hmm. And how will you assure guests prior to arrival that there is no safety concern? The best way to guarantee safety is for me to have nothing to do with the safety and security aspect of the festival. And we have handed off control to a major festival operator. Savannah Sellers is joining us now to peel back the curtain and give us a sense of what really went down. <laughs> it's the backstory. Yes, I love this. So take us inside the notebook. Is he so for real? So we all know what happened. He, right, he, he's been convicted. He served time. He still owes a lot of money to a lot of people. Well, for the first fire, for the disaster that was the first fire festival. Right. So this comes with the grain of salt, right? That that all happened. That just, went down. Just one grain. I just spoke with yeah, the whole shaker. I spoke with him. Holly, I was with him for almost an hour. Tell me everything I about I do it. have a lot of information, some off the record right now, just in terms of who this partner is and what exactly is going to go on. He does have a legitimate partner at this point. That is who is con in conversation with him about the date, about the location, about where they think they can handle it. And this is the partner he's referring to in that soundbite we just played. That's this exactly festival right. Festival organizer, he says he's, so it's basically a bona fide company, like a legit company that he's partnered up with. That has m produced several music festivals all over the world in the past. So that's information that is out there. He just doesn't want to tie them right now to some of these details okay. as, as some of this is just starting to piece together and come out. But the other thing that he did say in here, which we were able to confirm, is the location as is planned right now, it is near a real city. It has infrastructure. Guests would stay in hotels. They would eat at restaurants. They would use bathrooms that were not put up hours before and they this landed. This is the bar with now. Green water. Bathrooms that exist. <laughs> right. This is the bar for the festival. Right. But all of those things do exist in this location where they say they're going okay. to be. So, in theory, guests you know could come and safely stay, safely sleep, eat something. He also did tell me something, which you can ask me in a little bit about the cheese sandwiches. But oh no, it just. Tell me now. Okay, so first of all, he his story, uh, which some people on the internet have said, but this is according to Billy, basically that two guests went up and ordered those sandwiches. It wasn't they weren't widely giving them out. And if you look a little bit harder than just that viral cheese sandwich, there were tons of pictures of the chicken, the rice, the steak, the shrimp, other food. The viral cheese sandwich obviously just took over. But also, Hallie, get this, he's doubling down. He says at this next festival, he will be serving cheese sandwiches. He has to. They are going to be gourmet. He, has to. he said they're going to be amazing, and he said they're going to be the most expensive thing on the menu. The best in your life. It's going to be the best thousand yeah. dollar cheese yeah. sandwich you've ever had. Or 1.1 million. But how do you come into an interview like this with somebody who literally went to prison for fraud about the topic you're interviewing them on? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, you know, when you want to talk with somebody, when there's of there's interest there, and, and all of us have been talking about, you know, at NBC News for a while. I know you particularly love this story, which I love it. I'm sorry to get to bring this to you finally. Um, it's been a long time coming, right? We've been in conversation. I, I've been trying to understand what he's up to. He's been having these ancillary events other than just Fire Festival, which is part of his strategy, he says. He wants to create a community, he says, rather than just that music festival day. So people, for example, the 100 people who spent about $500 on tickets, who already purchased them, the minute that he announced in this video that you've probably seen wearing the bathrobe, it's coming back, here's 100 tickets, those people have been being invited to events. I've talked to some of them, I've been there, so I kind of was just trying to understand the whole operation, and eventually he was ready to share the date and the location, yeah. and, and he decided to come to us here. He tells you that in the past he was playing a character. Now he feels like it's time to get down to business. You are obviously going to go to it when it happens, yeah, right? Well, we'll see. Is okay, that no, we're sending you. A, yeah. If it yeah, happens, Is that an assignment? Go. I accept. Can I assign you to a story? Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> I think you absolutely. have that power. Um, because, just so, because of your dedication to this story, yes. It's just like, what is this thing going to be? I'm we're curious. We I'm are. curious, too, because he said, also I asked him, I said, do you think anybody who buys a ticket is kind of mostly just wondering if it's going to fail again and they want to be part of it? And he said... I think a lot of people, that is exactly what it is. They want to be part of the outcome no matter what it is. So Savannah Sellers, we'll a hot, fresh exclusive. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, a lot more to come here on the show, including more about what we know about this secretive court battle that's going down in Nevada with big succession energy. We're going to explain in our original coming up. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it's this real world version of succession set to play out in secret this month in a Nevada courtroom involving the very family that a lot of people speculate inspired the HBO drama.
the Murdochs, who run Fox News. All eyes are now on the future of this conservative news empire and who will wear the crown once 93-year-old Rupert is gone. NBC's Danny Savalos has more. The family of media mogul Rupert Murdoch duking it out in court. The battle, shrouded in secrecy, set to begin this month in front of a Nevada judge with a court administrator confirming the Murdoch proceedings are confidential. It's all presumably for control of his influential media empire, which includes the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post and Fox News. Nevada has the highest secrecy laws in the country when it comes to trust. It is impossible to find out whether a trust exists. More importantly, it's impossible to find out what's happening in probate court. But earlier this summer, a bombshell. The New York Times reporting, citing a sealed court document it obtained, that Mr. Murdoch made surprise changes to the family trust to, quote, consolidate decision-making power and put Lachlan, his eldest son, in charge. NBC News has not independently seen the document or confirmed its authenticity. Control of Murdoch's conglomerates has long been fodder for palace intrigue. As the 93-year-old conservative kingmaker, worth an estimated $20 billion, Married, remarried four times, aged, and retired. Four of his children, Lachlan, James, Elizabeth, and Prudence, were set to gain control when he died. Murdoch telling Charlie Rose almost two decades ago. If I go under a bus tomorrow, yeah. um, it'll be the, the four of them I'll have to decide. But much like in the HBO show, each child has reportedly been in and out of favor with their father over the years. What if I want to take over because I am the eldest son? Lachlan, once considered a long shot, now appears more aligned with his father's conservative politics, becoming the hand-picked heir. He's the CEO and chairman of Fox Corp and the chairman of News Corp. Neither company responded to our request for comment. Rupert's other children, more moderate politically, James just last week endorsing Kamala Harris for president, a representative for the attorney that's reportedly working for James, Elizabeth and Prudence, declined to comment on the legal battle, citing a gag order. We did not hear back from Rupert's attorneys. It's likely that Rupert Murdoch and Lachlan will prevail. But if they don't, then you could see a big shift in not just the control, but also the politics of News Corp. And Rupert Murdoch argues that would also damage the financial value of all those assets. Danny is joining us now. So high drama here and some media companies want the court to open up the proceedings. What are the chances that'll happen and we'll actually get a look at how this goes down? Low. And ordinarily, okay. courts are presumed open. It's difficult to seal a record and even more difficult to keep it sealed. But this is a situation in Nevada, thanks to a 2023 law and Nevada's push to become the state if you want to do your secret business dealings and have your trust there. And Nevada wants you to park your business in Nevada, and they've created legislation to help that. So if you're uh, playing the odds, seems very unlikely okay. that they're going to be able to open up this particular particular case. Danny Savalos, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention your brief cameo in succession. I'm not going to tell people which season. You'll have to watch to find out. Danny, thank you very much. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We're coming on the air with unpredictable and dangerous weather coast to coast with one storm strengthening as we speak, expected to hit Louisiana as a hurricane down south and out west, wildfires that could go in literally any direction. We're on the ground. We'll take you there live. We're also following a big update out of Idaho, where a judge is moving the trial of an accused serial killer, convinced by arguments that it couldn't be fair where it is. So what does this mean for the fight for justice for those four murdered students? Also, we're getting our first look at body cam video of an interview last year between police and the suspected Georgia school shooter with new questions about accountability as students there get ready to return to class just hours from now. Then our exclusive interview with NFL star Tyreek Hill, how he's responding tonight only to NBC News to that detention during a traffic stop right before the season opener. And Cowboy Carter getting no love tonight from the country music world. Why Beyonce's humongous album is getting snubbed at the CMAs. And what that says about this music moment later in the show. 
Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're starting tonight with this split screen of intense and dangerous weather with fires burning out of control in the West and that Hurricane Center update dropping in just the last hour on the newly formed tropical storm taking aim at the South, one that's expected to become a hurricane tonight. Let's start with what's happening out West. This huge, look at this, line fire burning east of L.A., only 3% contained right now, some 20,000 acres already gone. This thing's threatening more than 30,000 homes. Schools are shut down. Three firefighters are already hurt. And here's one of the big challenges. They just don't know where this fire is going to go next. You've got 11,000 people under evacuation orders, with one couple telling NBC News they landed back at LAX after the trip that they were taking, raced home to see what was going on. Watch this. We hightailed it here as fast as we can, and now they've got the access point closed off. So we're really worried. We have to get our pets. We have to get medicines, family member. I want to show you some of the buildings going up in flames north of San Francisco. This is the Boyles Fire, where thousands more people are also being forced to leave home. Just two of some 70 big fires. You see some of them here burning across 11 states. All of it happening is there's this split screen with storm preparations down south. Look at this. You've got parts of Louisiana and Texas bracing for tropical storm Francine getting stronger faster in the Gulf of Mexico. At least one school system has already shut down just protectively. And you've got evacuation orders going into place in other parts of Louisiana. Bill Cairns will break that down in just a second, but I want to start with NBC's Steve Patterson, who is live for us in Mentone, California. Steve, talk us through what the latest is with these fires. Any chance that people will be able to get back into their homes anytime soon? No, uh, and that is okay. for a number of reasons. First of all, this is still a very much an active firefight, obviously. 23,000 acres now. That number just updated a few minutes ago. More evacuations. We've seen almost fresh evacuation orders every two hours or so. So this is still burning out of control in many ways. Yes, they have a containment number. Yes, that is a positive sign. 3% containment is nothing to sneeze at, but it is certainly not in control. Part of that is the weather system, not external but internally, the one that it has created, these pyrocumulus clouds that create thunderstorm-like conditions, the winds that it is generating itself makes itself more erratic. So firefighters are worried about which direction this fire continues to burn, and they will be in Suchily until this thing is put out. I just spoke to a firefighter about another problem, which is the terrain, incredibly steep. You can see it, but well, you probably can't see it now because everything is covered in smoke, but firefighters hand crews are up there trying to take a hold of this thing and it's very difficult listen to this these hills behind me are extremely steep not only steep they're inaccessible by any vehicle so our crews have to hike in in this heat with all their gear on that's what is making this such a difficult fire to fight steep inaccessible and here's the the latest ingredient which is that it's miserably hot it's incredibly hot hopefully temperatures will start to die down tonight that's what happened last night that's why they got some modicum of progress on this fire firefighters hoping that happens again tonight Hallie. they need some relief out there steve patterson live for us in california thank you you've also got what's happening down south that tropical storm picking up speed it's moving west now and it's probably going to end up as a hurricane at the next update right um, either that one or tomorrow morning. So e either way, it does, yeah, right now it's a strong tropical storm already and everyone's trying to make those decisions. You know, uh, do I have to evacuate? Uh, do, do I need to board up? Do I, can I just stay in place and ride this one out? That's what everyone in Louisiana over to the Port Arthur Beaumont area is looking at now and trying to make those decisions tonight and tomorrow, or at least getting ready to go in case that order comes. And then we will start getting evacuation orders likely later tonight or tomorrow morning and mostly for southern coastal areas there of Louisiana, possibly or especially around Cameron Parish. So this is the forecast from the Hurricane Center. They do bring it up to a Category 2 storm. So that's a serious storm. 100 mile per hour winds. That's enough to do significant damage where it makes landfall. This area, there's not a lot of big cities. It's very swampy. There's some small towns, some fishing villages in this region of Louisiana. And after it moves inland, it's going to weaken rather quickly. So that's the good news with this storm. But the bad news is it has everything that comes with a hurricane. The heavy rains will be inland, isolated the tornadoes will be possible. We still have to deal with flash flooding. And then we'll watch the storm weakening as it heads up the Mississippi River as we go into Thursday and Friday. So by the numbers, we are watching that uh, 
hurricane warning, Cameron Parish over to Morgan City, and we are expecting our computer models, Hallie. We've been kind of like central Louisiana, but they've shifted a little west. So a lot of people have been wondering, you know, like which way are we trending? We were trending closer to New Orleans, and now we've trended back to the west. So that's why we're really targeting areas from Cameron to New Iberia to Morgan City. So uh, obviously, we have 48 hours for this one uh, to play out, but this does look like a serious storm. This one will likely be another big disaster. And you're thinking Wednesday morning is when it's going to smash. Wednesday the morning is when we'll have the rain. You know, you'll see the reporters on TV kind of blowing yeah, around. Yeah. And then, then Wednesday evening okay. is when the max storm surge, the highest winds, Yikes. that's when it gets deadly. Uh, Bill Karens, you got a lot ahead of you over the next 48 hours as well. Thank you for that forecast. Really important. Stake you out, West, because tonight a judge in Idaho is moving the trial of an accused serial killer after his defense team argued there is no way he's going to get a fair trial in the small town where these murders happened. Four students killed at the University of Idaho back in November of 22. The victims, you see them here, Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Ethan Chapin, Zana Kernodal. They were all found stabbed to death in Moscow, Idaho. A stunning crime, wall-to-wall -wall media coverage, a six-week manhunt for the suspect, a ton of speculation online, and then, of course, the arrest of this man, Brian Koberger. His lawyers filed a motion to change the venue. They said, wait a second, all this coverage means they're not going to be able to find a pool of impartial jurors in the county where the crime happened. And today... In a dramatic move, the judge agreed. He called it one of the most difficult decisions of his career. Let's bring in Morgan Chesky, who's been following this for us. Why was this so difficult for, this, for the judge to come to this decision here in a trial that has seen a number of delays before this thing gets started? Yeah, Hallie, I think one of the reasons it was difficult was because this judge knows how many eyes are watching this case step by step since this horrific tragedy uh, took place in that tiny community of Moscow. He mentioned a couple key factors in contributing to this decision. Number one, the lack of resources there in that community, particularly in the courthouse itself, to handle a trial of this magnitude. Uh, and number two, he mentioned, the, of course, the coverage that this has garnered nationwide but I do want to point out something that, that's very interesting here, Hallie, because on its face, you could call this a win for the Koberger defense team. But the judge and the defense team both referenced a survey that took place both in Latok County and in Ada County, where Boise, the capital of Idaho, is located, where they asked respondents to weigh in on the potential guilt of Koberger, the turnout in Lata County, 67% of people identified him as guilty. 24% said that Koberger was definitely guilty. And so they were arguing for a change of venue and another city to have this trial in Ada, where Boise is located, Hallie. Still, 68% of survey respondents said they believed Koberger was guilty. 22% believed very guilty. So even though the defense trying to get it out of Moscow, uh, according to that survey and the numbers, not significant differences there in this survey. So what are we hearing from the families, the victims to this? Uh, well, they're clearly incensed uh, at the result of this judge's decision. I want to share with you in part what the family of Kaylee Gonzalez said uh, following this announcement that came earlier today. And it said, the only good thing about this decision is it will be judge judge's last decision in this case. If the judge knew Lata County could not handle the trial for safety re reasons, not enough court clerks, logistics, and lacking space, why did we waste over a year mm -hmm in a county he knew was not going to handle the trial. As for that trial, Hallie, uh, despite this back and forth over venue, back on June 27th, they did set the date for June 2nd, 2025. As for where it'll be taking place, TBD. We think potentially the defense has asked for at least Boise, right? They've asked for that. However, that's going to be under the okay. discretion of an administrative director here. Hallie. All right. Morgan Chesky, live for us with those developments. Thank you. We're also learning tonight the fugitive suspect accused of apparently randomly just firing at cars driving on the highway had texted somebody about a half an hour before that saying he intended to, I'm quoting here, to kill a lot of people. These chilling new details are coming in an affidavit for an arrest warrant obtained by NBC News as officials look for that suspected gunman. They want him to surrender as they are still on this manhunt. Watch. If, if he does have social media, if he does have a family out there that cares for him, you know, turn yourself in. Don't make this worse than what it is. 
Police say the 32-year-old was just firing at oncoming traffic along the interstate that runs between Lexington, Kentucky, and Knoxville, Tennessee, hitting about a dozen cars. Five people ended up seriously hurt, just terrifying moments for so many. Adrian Bradas is joining us now. Where does this manhunt stand, Adrian? Hallie, investigators are still searching, but they only have a few hours of daylight left. And once nightfall hits, it is too dangerous for teams to enter that wooded area, which is about eight miles from where we are. We're talking about a rugged terrain, and there are additional elements that the search team is dealing with. We're talking about elements like caves, snakes, and sinkholes. Right now, they are rotating groups of 25 to 50 uh, people inside to go and look for that 32-year-old Joseph Crouch. Here's what, Couch, excuse me, here's what we know about him so far. He sent a text message to a woman about 30 minutes before that highway shooting on Saturday, saying in part, I'm going to kill a lot of people. Well, try at least. He also sent another message saying, I'll kill myself afterwards. We heard from investigators that the AR-15 rifle they believe that was used in the shooting was purchased on the same day of the shooting. Now, that woman who we sent the text messages to tried to warn officials, calling 911 before this shooting even unfolded. At least five people were seriously injured, Hallie. Someone was shot in the face, another person was shot in the arm. And they're still looking for that 32 year old tonight. Adrian brought us as that urgent search continues live for us there in London, Kentucky. Thank you. Let's take you to politics now, because in just the last hour or so, we've seen Vice President Kamala Harris landing in Philadelphia, the site of tomorrow night's high-profile, high-stakes debate. Want to show you walking off Air Force Two? Here she is. Look at that. Yesterday, she gave a thumbs up in Pittsburgh. Today, she's getting ready for that big moment just about 24 hours from now, as we're getting some new details on the campaign prep for both candidates. It could be one of the most consequential moments in this race certainly the highest profile moment yet. And both campaigns are holding what's being described as extensive prep sessions in different ways. And that's a little bit surprising maybe for the guy on the left there, former President Trump. For a while, his campaign has said that he doesn't really do formal prep, uh, that he does interviews, takes questions, and that's kind of enough. All of it's happening as the latest polls show that this race is neck and neck. Well within the margin of error among likely voters nationally, according to the latest New York Times Siena poll, one of the most closely watched in the country. And it's a similar story in battleground states, well inside the margin of error in those key Rust Belt battlegrounds. Vaughn Hilliard is standing by with the latest on the Trump side, but I want to start with Mike Memoli, who's posted up outside the White House. Here we go. That same poll, ma'am, showed that about three in 10 Americans say they want to know more. They need to learn more about Kamala Harris. Only about one in 10 say the same thing about Donald Trump. She's had a number of moments to try to introduce herself to Americans, including, of course, those primetime speeches at the Democratic National Convention last month. But this is critical for, for her. What are you hearing behind the scenes from sources about how this is going to go down? Yeah, and the Harris campaign really does, does look for every opportunity to underscore what an unusual situation the vice president finds herself in. She didn't go through a long primary to establish herself to the country. She didn't have a long campaign even to get to this point where she would have done all those biographical elements. So this debate is particularly a challenge for her. She has to be ready to answer all the policy questions the moderator asks her. She has to be ready to deal with what Donald Trump will bring. And she's been talking about what that might look like in terms of some of the personal attacks. But when you see those poll numbers, it really does underscore what might be the most important thing she could use in this debate, which is to further introduce herself to the country. And we understand from our reporting that part of as they've been in Pittsburgh and doing this intensive mock prep sessions, they've been looking for opportunities to answer policy questions with biographical elements. That's going to be so critical now. When you look at foreign policy, she's also got this new policy page that's up on her website mm -hmm. uh, overnight, ma'am, right? And this is an issue where critics have said, hey, listen, she's been light on policy. It's time to put some meat on the bone on that front, if you will. We know foreign policy will be front and center. We also know that just today, House Republicans are looking to make that an issue, releasing this mm -hmm. long-awaited Afghanistan report on that chaotic withdrawal, a withdrawal that was, of course, initiated by former President Trump when he was in office. The White House, Democrats have suggested it's partisan. Yet it is likely going to be an issue that the former president tries to hit her on tomorrow night. 
Absolutely. One of his goals is to link her to all the unpopular aspects about President Biden and the withdrawal from Afghanistan, certainly one of the most challenging moments for the Biden presidency. This is really another big challenge. We haven't had a sitting vice president running for president in a quarter century. And you want to claim all the good things of the administration you're a part of and also distance yourself from some of those things. But it's a tricky question because you can't really say I wasn't part of the decision making and still say you were a valuable part of that administration. So definitely a tough uh, needle to thread in this moment for the vice president. Mike Memoli, lots to watch over the course of the next day and a half. Thank you very much. Let's bring in Vaughn Hilliard now with the view from the Trump side of things. We are getting ready, of course, for debate. Uh, big debate night tomorrow. Lots of special coverage with uh, sort of the political universe moving down to Philadelphia tomorrow night. Former President Trump has been prepping at his home in South Florida. And I say the word prepping not lightly because they often say, listen, and we hear this from allies. I know you hear it. He does interviews. He takes tough questions. That's basically his prep. He's actually doing some policy sessions with allies, right? Right. And that was the posture back in June ahead of the Joe Biden debate sure. that he does rallies. But for a long time, it's been like that. Exactly. Donald Trump, they say Donald Trump doesn't sit and do mock debates. He would never do a 90-minute session. And that's where the acknowledgement that he's actually doing some debate prep for this one is notable. He did that yesterday at Mar-a-Lago. We were told that he was going to be doing a few sessions here today before making his way to Philadelphia. And let's be very clear, right? Kamala Harris, back in 2019, when she was running for president herself, she had a visualization of what it would be debate Donald Trump, right? She said she couldn't wait for the day that she got to prosecute the case toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with Donald Trump. But for the Republican nominee, this really didn't come into focus in until about two months ago mm -hmm. when Kamala Harris took over the top of the ticket. I'm told by a top advisor to Donald Trump that he has really been focused in during this debate prep on two parts of it. Number one, making the case of the American electorate that Kamala Harris was not, in this advisor's words, complicit uh, or was complicit over the last three and a half years for all the actions and decisions that were made by the Biden, Biden administration, that she wasn't just some bystander and was not responsible for any of the foreign policy, economic decision making. They're looking to lash her to his record. Exactly. And then the second part I'm told is that they were preparing for what they expect to be right one-liners or quick quips from Kamala Harris and how she may respond to Trump and how he could then turn it back towards her, knowing that she will be eager and prepared over these two hours. So what's the thing that you're going to be looking for, Vaughn, is you're going to be watching this like the rest of us, looking to see this incredibly high-profile moment. We don't know if there's going to be a second debate. We think maybe. It's not clear. What's your sense? I think my question is, to what extent is Donald Trump cornered into answering policy specifics? Mm or even justifying his actions around the January 6th attack or about any of the underlying claims and allegations that were made of over any of the indictments. Because that's two months ago what we were anticipating before the Joe Biden debate. But Democrats were frustrated because they felt like Joe Biden missed the opportunity with the American electorate watching to hold him accountable, they said, for some of Donald Trump's own past actions and words. And now the question here is, will Kamala Harris try to force him? We saw this in a, in a sort of a jumble mumbled response to child care policy from Donald Trump last week when he actually is held to feet to the fire on some policy specifics. Will he deliver in over these last 48 hours of debate prep as he worked to you know, polish some of these policy positions here with the millions of Americans that are going to be watching and ultimately going to hold his own fate, his own future of 2025 in their hands? Vaughn Hilliard, thank you very much. We'll Thanks be talking me. more, I know, in the day to come. It's good to see you. Tune in tomorrow night, obviously, when Kamala Harris and Donald Trump face off. You can watch all of the coverage starting right here on NBC News Now, starting really at 4 p.m. Eastern if you want to pregame super hard. Otherwise, we'll see you at 8 o'clock on the network and right here on streaming. We'll see you then. Got to get to some developing news into us. An exclusive interview that's coming into us with NFL superstar Tyreek Hill. Remember, it was just about 24 hours ago that that incident happened where he was detained and handcuffed right before the season opener for the Miami Dolphins. Look at this. This is video of Hill on the ground getting cuffed. He's not far from Hard Rock Stadium just a couple of hours before the Dolphins' home opener against the Jaguars. Police have not released the body cam footage of the incident just yet, but the head of the Miami-Dade Police Department tells the Miami Herald that video is part of the reason why the police officer is off the streets on administrative leave for now. Now, the police union is weighing into this whole thing, accusing Hill of not being, quote, immediately cooperative with the officers on scene, saying he refused to sit on the ground. Marissa Parra is live for us in Miami. Our Jesse Kirsch just wrapped up, like literally in the last couple of minutes, this exclusive interview with, Ty with Tyreek Hill. And he's asking about that statement from the police union. Walk us through it. 
Well, I am also waiting to see that interview, Hallie, but my understanding is uh, he said he hasn't ruled out taking legal action against Miami-Dade police, but I want to take you to what we're hearing in the interview itself. Have you seen what the police union has said about this? No, I haven't. So the police union says you're driving leading up to this traffic incident, quote, uh, put, quote, others in great risk of danger. So okay. they're accusing you of driving in a dangerous manner. Okay. And then they say in the aftermath, you're saying you were cooperating. Right. The police union says you were not cooperating. Right. It sounds like you very much dispute what the police union is saying. I mean, you know, everybody has their own size, their own version, you know, and I feel like they do that, you, you know, to kind of protect, you know, um, the officer which is right, you know, you gotta have, you know, your teammate back, you know, but I feel like at the end of the day, you know, um, if you, if you like roll up on somebody all hostile, knocking on their window and they already had got their ID, you know what I'm saying, ready for you, it's not like I said, you're not getting my ID, you're not getting my ID, you know, it was one of those situations where it's like, here go my ID, sir, you know, and I let back up my window, he said, let it down, I let it down, and then that's when it went from zero to 10, the other officer came in, just pulled me out, and Hallie, quickly on the other side of this, we know that Miami-Dade's mayor has called this whole situation troubling. And just to recap, we know, of course, that one person has been placed on administrative duties as this investigation continues. But it remains to be seen whether or not or when we will see that police-worn video, Hallie. Marissa Parra, uh, thank you very much for that. You can see more of the exclusive interview with Tyreek Hill coming up tonight on Nightly News with Lester Holt. That's 630 on your local NBC station. We're also getting our first look at body cam video of a police interview with a teenager suspected of that deadly shooting at a Georgia high school. This interview happened last year. I want to show it to you. You see him and his father talking about access that this boy has to guns. Now, we've known this interview happened, what was said in it, but it's our first actual look at it as students at Appalachia High School get ready to return to class. The superintendent in that county says they are adding extra security, even with some of these new questions now about accountability. That's after a Washington Post report shared that the suspected shooter's mother called the school the morning of the shooting and warned them. She sounded the alarm about what she described as an extreme emergency. Priscilla Thompson is on the scene there in Winder, Georgia. She's been following every twist and turn in this because these accountability questions are not going anywhere right now, especially not with these new details about the suspected shooter. Walk us through it. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. So first, there are questions about what happened after police went to that home last year and interviewed the suspect and his father. If you watch that video, they only spoke with the suspect for less than 10 minutes. And four times in that video, he denied making any threats to perform a school shooting or anything um, like that. And then police left. The police officer basically said, I'm taking you at your word. I'm looking you in the eye. That's all I can do. And they left saying that it was an unsubstantial substantiated threat. So there are big questions around what the follow-up looked like in the year since that conversation happened. We did reach out to the sheriff's office to ask those questions, but they're referring everything to the district attorney's office. And of course, the other big question here is that we now know that the mother did call into the school to issue an urgent warning about related to her son about a half hour before gunfire erupted. And we I spoke with uh, the mother of a student who was in the classroom with the shooter, and she, her daughter tells her that someone did come into the classroom looking for someone. Take a listen to what she shared with us. She saw the fact that she was there in the room when they came to look for the kid, and she thought that he was another kid with a very similar name. And they took that kid's backpack and found out that he wasn't the right kid. And then about 10 to 15 minutes later, that's when the one they were looking for came shooting. So I feel like if they would have acted in the beginning, maybe some of the lives could have been saved today. And that last point that she made is undoubtedly on the minds of many people in this community today, whether over the past year or on the day of that shooting, anything could have been done that would have changed this outcome. Hallie? And just quickly, Priscilla, the superintendent is promising that school is going to look a little bit different for the kids coming back tomorrow, right? 
Yes, so there are going to be mental health resources on campus. He's also saying there's going to be an elevated law enforcement presence on campus, something that we've also seen here at this site with a state patrol officer who has been driving around the parking lot earlier today. And the superintendent also says that he understands that safety is a priority and he is open to hearing from the community. Take a listen to some of what he said earlier. We won't always agree, but I want us to give each other the benefit of the doubt that we are all bringing forward thoughts, ideas, and concerns with our children at the forefront. And he also said that if students and staff do not feel comfortable coming back, they do not have to come back. It is totally up to them. But those schools are going to be reopened across the district. But notably, the high school here will remain closed. Hallie? Priscilla Thompson live for us there in Winder. Thank you. Coming up, the new tributes that are coming into us fast and furious for legendary actor James Earl Jones. How people are remembering him tonight in just a sec. Kate Middleton says she has now completed tough chemo treatments. The first big news we're getting from her after she revealed she was being treated for cancer back in March. The Princess of Wales now says she's going to pick up a light schedule through the end of the year and putting out a video message. Watch this. Although I finished chemotherapy, my path to healing and full recovery is long, and I must continue to take each day as it comes. I am, however, looking forward to being back at work and undertaking a few more public engagements in the coming months when I can. Despite all that's gone before, I enter this new phase of recovery with a renewed sense of hope and appreciation of life. Danielle Hamamjian has more from outside Buckingham Palace. Well, in the words of Princess Kate, it's been an incredibly rough nine months, and she said that life can change in just an instant, as anybody who has been through this will tell you that it's not just the chemotherapy, it is the recovery period after the treatment, and that's where she finds herself now. And so it's going to be a gradual return to work for Kate. Uh, and in this video, we talk, we hear her say that, um, that the journey for her has been, quote, complex, scary, and unpredictable. She, that she, she said that she had to ha face um, her own vulnerabilities, and that has given her a new perspective perspective. Um, the video is quite an intimate portrayal of this family. Uh, it is a glimpse into the fa into the lives of the future queen, the future king and their three children. And it shows them in a way we've never seen them before, really uh, running around on the beach, having a picnic, playing cards. Uh, we see Kate's head uh, resting on the shoulder of uh, Prince William and a level of, of affection that we're not used to seeing between the two. Uh, but this <laughs> This, as Princess Kate talks about the future now and what will that look like? Well, in the next few months, she hopes to attend a handful of events. There are some big dates on the royal calendar. The next one being Remembrance Sunday, that is in November. The entire royal family will be attending. Will she attend? We will find out closer to the date. Our thanks to Danielle Hamamjian for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the tributes coming in for this man. I know you recognize him. Legendary actor James Earl Jones. He has died at the age of 93. Mufasa in The Lion King. You know he was in The Sandlot. He was the voice of Darth Vader, too. With Mark Hamill, who played Luke Skywalker, reacting to his death on social media, saying, R.I.P. Dad. It was an incredible seven-decade career. So many people remembering and honoring him and that amazing voice tonight. Number two, hockey players, families, friends, mourning the death of the NHL player and his brother killed while riding bikes, with his widow revealing she's pregnant with their third child, Johnny Goudreau we're talking about, at the funeral for both he and his brother today. An SUV hit and killed them about a week and a half ago, right before their sister's wedding. The driver who hit them is suspected of being drunk and is behind bars ahead of a hearing later this week. Number three, a representative for Harvey Weinstein says he had emergency heart surgery today. The disgraced movie mogul moved late last night from Rikers Island to a hospital after saying he didn't feel well. His rep says he's now in the ICU waiting for test results. Number four, Beyonce shut out of the Country Music Awards today. Car Cowboy Carter got a grand total of zero nominations. That includes Texas Hold'em. Nothing for that either. 
Remember, that was a monster song, the first song by a black female artist to top Billboard's Hot Country Songs chart after it came out back in February. A rep for Beyonce did not immediately respond to a rep for comment about the snub. Number five, Pope Francis arriving in East Timor today, where most of the people are Catholic, for a three-day stop as he's been traveling around the Asia Pacific. Look at this, tens of thousands of people in the streets. This is one of the poorest countries in the world. The church there has recently dealt with abuse scandals. More than half a million people could end up at the Pope's open air mass tomorrow as part of his, one of the longest trips he's taken as he's been dealing with some health issues. When we come back, the international manhunt happening right now. What police in Australia say a man allegedly threw on a baby. Plus, some scary scenes out of Norway. Why officials think an animal is behind at least four attacks. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here is a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Vietnam, more than 60 people have been killed as a huge typhoon tears across the region. You can see, look at this, this bridge. Well, it used to be a bridge, totally collapsed. This is the strongest typhoon to hit Vietnam in decades, with winds reaching more than 90 miles an hour. Officials are warning that all of this rain could mean even more floods and maybe landslides in the days to come. Out of Australia, an international manhunt happening now for a man suspected of pouring hot coffee onto a baby. Just horrific. You're looking at security footage of him here. The nine-month-old was taken to the hospital with serious burns and had to go through multiple surgeries. Police say the suspect fled the country just hours before they ID'd him. We don't know yet his name or what country he went to. Fortunately, even after those surgeries, the baby is expected to be okay. And out of Norway, a golden eagle attacking this man six times in the mountains. We're talking a 15-minute attack with the bird scratching, clawing his face as the guy sprinted down the mountain. Officials think it's the same eagle that attacked three other people in southern Norway in the past week, including a toddler who had to get stitches. The bird was killed after hurting the child. So right now, Vice President Harris and former President Trump are in the final hours of prep before Tuesday's debate, a matchup that could put more eyes on these two presidential candidates than any other event leading up to the November election. And for Harris, it's an opportunity to try to define herself. At least that's what her campaign is hoping, not just as President Biden's replacement on the ticket, but as the person best suited to take his job. I'm joined now by Democratic strategist and co-host of the Politics War Room podcast, James Carville. We are so glad to have you on the show. Thank you for doing it. We're, we're, we're thrilled you're joining us. We're glad to be here. Thank you. Well, the timing's interesting because we were reading your op-ed in the New York Times that lays out a few key steps for the vice president that you think she'll need to do to defeat the former president. And one of them right. is essentially to let Donald Trump be Donald Trump tomorrow. So how does she do that without letting him steamroll? Or is that part of the point? Well, I don't think he's going to be able to steamroll. I mean, it's it, it, the... the term the negotiations are pretty specific and she can point to that and the, the host of that. I actually I, I hate to say this because you're not supposed to say it. I think Trump is walking into a giant trap. Okay, why? I, if I was campaign I think she's well prepared. She's been in Pittsburgh. She's got really top people preparing her. She's gonna have low expectations because the President Biden did so horribly in June. It wasn't that Trump did great. It was that President Biden didn't do very well at all. And I I, I to say this, I could be eating my words uh on Wednesday, but I think she's going to do quite well, and I think he made a big mistake by accepting this debate. Well, I really do. Okay. Clip and save this, and we'll find out on Wednesday morning or tomorrow yeah. night. How that feels. You can laugh at me. I'm going to fool myself, but well, no, okay. But, but let me ask you this, James. You, you say she's well prepared. She, she has do. been holed up in Pittsburgh since Thursday getting ready for this. Do you worry that there is a risk of over-preparation? We've seen that with some candidates before. Are you concerned that she could be over-prepping? Well, for somebody who never studied very hard, I, I don't know that I over prep anything. I just kind of go ahead and wing it. No, I'm not too worried about that. I think they're practicing their timing. I think she has four or five, like, lines that she keeps in her back pocket that she can use regardless of what he comes up with. She's actually a, an experienced uh, lawyer, uh, trial attorney, prosecutor, and he's not that good. He's not that great, and mm. she has great opportunity because he has 100% knowledge. 
People know who she is. They don't know what she is, I pointed out, in the piece. And I think she can fill out a, a pretty good picture of who she is and what she stands for. I, th I think the op upside for her is really is okay. much bigger than the upside for him. You talked about maybe there's some lines in her back pocket. You know a thing or two about lines. That The one that comes up for me, of course, is the phrase, it's the economy, stupid, that you are, of course, one of the architects of is when you were working with former President Clinton um, back in the, the early 90s. Um, when you talk about the economy, when you look at this issue that you know is so critical to so many Americans around the country, they tell us that again and again in polls and in person. How does she try to close the gap between where the numbers are and the way that people feel in what a lot of experts have termed the vibe session, if you will? Well, first of all, the, the gap is close. A lot of it was just because they thought that President Biden was, you know, we weren't in control of things. Last time I saw polls, it was, it was pretty, you know, within single digits. Uh, views in the economy are not static. Uh, there'll be a rate cut. I think she can talk about, you know, some of the things she's talking about, different kind of capital gains tax. And she can also uh, contrast his tariffs, which never work, you know, to, to what she wants to do. I, I don't think she has to cede that ground to him at all. And the truth of the matter is, and I keep asking people, well, what's the evidence that the economy was in, under the first three years of Trump was any better than the last year of President Obama? I don't, I don't know of any. No one's been able to show anything to me about that. But uh, she'll, she'll be able to do just fine on that, and I okay. guarantee you she's ready for it. I promise you. She's well, really ready. Speaking of people who are who are ready for it, what's been interesting is our team's new reporting that suggests former President Trump is doing maybe more of these so-called policy sessions to get ready for tomorrow night. That's a bit of a shift. You know that his campaign has long said that he doesn't really do prep. He does interviews. He takes questions. That's kind of how he gets ready. What is this apparent shift or at least the the but the making public of the prep session say to you about where the former president's head may be at as he prepares for this face-off against Vice President Harris? Well, I think he has donors and supporters mm -hmm. about, about all of them, the, the higher end ones are kind of scared, and they should be scared. And they're trying to reassure people, oh, no, he, he, he's in prep, he, he's studying policies. Of course, he's doing no such thing. And I, 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 I continue to believe that he's going to walk right into a giant sawmill okay. tomorrow. Let me ask. But, I'm sorry, James. Yeah. I didn't mean to step on you. I mean, I love a Zoom, but I hate it, too. I wanted to get in a quick question to you about the new documentary coming out, because I'm interested to watch it this fall, about the raising of alarms of President Biden's candidacy. And you specifically, as one of the people who came out early, you came out vociferously, I would say, um, uh, raising some of those alarm bells, sounding some of those alarm bells. What kind of lasting impact, if any, do you think that that whole situation is going to have on the party, not just this cycle, but in the years to come? Well, look, I think President Biden made a wise decision. And I think the party has completely moved on for that. I, I really don't I think historically it, it's going to be viewed that the Democratic Party came to the correct decision late in the cycle, but I don't see much lasting damage from it. Uh, I would certainly rather be remembered for other things over my career than this, but uh, I understand that some people ask me about it, but no one's mad at me anymore. But I was in Chicago for the convention, and people are uh, upbeat, and right. I think the information will be upbeat, you know? I'm I've done a lot of things in my life. That's just one of them. I hope it doesn't stand out above other things. But I think the film will be pretty good on that. Right. I know it will. <laughs> James Carville, no longer persona non grata inside the Democratic Party, apparently. Thank you very much for being with us, sir. Well, really you, appreciate really awesome. your time. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. So listen, yeah. coming up, we've got answers to the thing that I know has been keeping you up every single night this week. Where is Fire Festival 2 going to be? And when? And how much is it going to cost me? Well, good thing our Savannah Sellers got an exclusive interview with the man now out of prison behind the whole thing. You're not going to want to miss it. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, it's an interview you will only see right here on NBC News on one of the most infamous scams of this current century. The one involving the leaky FEMA tents, the depressing cheese sandwiches. That's right, the fire festival. Because if you've been watching this show, you know it's back. At least the guy who went to prison for fraud over the whole thing says it's back, and he's hoping to sell tickets for 
you know, whatever it's going to be. Billy McFarlane himself is now getting specific, like a little more specific about Firefest, the sequel in a broadcast exclusive with our Savannah Sellers. OK, so when is it going to be? He says April of next year. How much is it going to cost you? Anywhere from fourteen hundred dollars to more than a million. <clears throat> Where is it going to be? A private island, apparently, this time off the coast of Mexico. Who's going to be there? Well, no big name talent yet, but McFarland is promising. He says things are going to go smoothly this time. How will you guarantee the safety of guests? Mm -hmm. And how will you assure guests prior to arrival that there is no safety concern? The best way to guarantee safety is for me to have nothing to do with the safety and security aspect of the festival. And we have handed off control to a major festival operator. Savannah Sellers is joining us now to peel back the curtain and give us a sense of what really went down. <laughs> it's the backstory. Yes, I love this. To so take us inside the notebook. Is he so for real? So we all know what happened. He, right, he, he's been convicted. He served time. He still owes a lot of money to a lot of people. Well, for the first fire, for the disaster that was the first fire festival. Right. So this comes with the grain of salt, right? That that all happened. That just went to, down. Just one grain. I just spoke with yeah, the whole shaker. I spoke with him. Holly, I was with him for almost an hour. Tell me everything I about I do it. have a lot of information, some off the record right now, just in terms of who this partner is and what exactly is going to go on. He does have a legitimate partner at this point. That is who is con in conversation with him about the date, about the location, about where they think they can handle it. And this is the partner he's referring to in that soundbite we just played. That's this exactly festival right. Festival organizer. He says he's, so it's basically a bona fide company, like a legit company that he's partnered up with. That has m produced several music festivals all over the world in the past. So that's information that is out there. He just doesn't want to tie them right now to some of these details okay. as, as some of this is just starting to piece together and come out. But the other thing that he did say here, in here, which we were able to confirm, is the location as is planned right now, it is near a real city. It has infrastructure. Guests would stay in hotels. They would eat at restaurants. They would use bathrooms that were not put up hours before and they this landed. This is the bar now. Green water. Bathrooms that exist. This <laughs> right. is the bar for the festival. Right. But all of those things do exist in this location where they say they're going to be. So, in theory, guests you know, could come and safely stay, safely sleep, eat something. He also did tell me something, which you can ask me in a little bit about the cheese sandwiches. But Oh, no, it just... Tell me now. Okay, so first of all, he his story, uh, which some people on the internet have said, but this is according to Billy, basically that two guests went up and ordered those sandwiches. It wasn't they weren't widely giving them out. And if you look a little bit harder than just that viral cheese sandwich, there were tons of pictures of the chicken, the rice, the steak, the shrimp, other food. The viral cheese sandwich obviously just took over. But also, Hallie, get this, he's doubling down. He says at this next festival, he will be serving cheese sandwiches. He has to. They are going to be he gourmet. To. He said they're gonna be amazing, and he said they're gonna be the most expensive thing on the menu. The best in your life. It's going to be the best thousand dollar cheese yeah. sandwich you've ever had. Or 1.1 million. But how do you come into an interview like this with somebody who literally went to prison for fraud about the topic you're interviewing them on? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, you know, when you want to talk with somebody, when there's of there's interest there, and, and all of us have been talking about, you know, at NBC News for a while. I know you particularly love this story, which I love it. I'm so happy to get to bring this to you finally. Um, it's been a long time coming, right? We've been in conversation. I, I've been trying to understand what he's up to. He's been having these ancillary events other than just Fire Festival, which is part of his strategy, he says. He wants to create a community, he says, rather than just that music festival day. So people, for example, the 100 people who spent about a $500 on tickets, who already purchased them, the minute that he announced in this video that you've probably seen wearing the bathrobe, it's coming back, here's 100 tickets. Those people have been being invited to events. I've talked to some of them, I've been there. So I kind of was just trying to understand the whole operation. And eventually he was ready to share the date and the location, yeah. and, and he decided to come to us here. He tells you that in the past he was playing a character. Now he feels like it's time to get down to business. You are obviously going to go to it when it happens, yeah, right? Well, we'll see. Is okay, that no, we're sending you. A, yeah. If it yeah, happens, I, Is that an assignment? Go. I accept. Can I assign you to a story? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I think Absolutely. you have that power. Um, because, just so, because of your dedication to this story, yes. It's just like, what is this thing going to be? I'm we're curious. We I'm are. curious, too, because he said, also I asked him, I said, do you think anybody who buys a ticket is kind of mostly just wondering if it's going to fail again and they want to be part of it? And he said... I think a lot of people, that is exactly what it is. They want to be part of the outcome no matter what it is. So Savannah Sellers, we'll uh, hot, fresh, exclusive. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot more to come here on the show, including more about what we know about this secretive court battle that's going down in Nevada with big succession energy. We're going to explain in our original coming up.
to tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it's this real world version of succession set to play out in secret this month in a Nevada courtroom involving the very family that a lot of people speculate inspired the HBO drama, the Murdochs who run Fox News. All eyes are now on the future of this conservative news empire and who will wear the crown once 93 year old Rupert is gone. NBC's Danny Savalos has more. The family of media mogul Rupert Murdoch duking it out in court, the battle shrouded in secrecy set to begin this month in front of a Nevada judge with a court administrator confirming the Murdoch proceedings are confidential. It's all presumably for control of his influential media empire, which includes the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post and Fox News. Nevada has the highest secrecy laws in the country when it comes to trust. It is impossible to find out whether a trust exists. More importantly, it's impossible to find out what's happening in probate court. But earlier this summer, a bombshell. The New York Times reporting, citing a sealed court document it obtained, that Mr. Murdoch made surprise changes to the family trust to, quote, consolidate decision-making power and put Lachlan, his eldest son, in charge. NBC News has not independently seen the document or confirmed its authenticity. Control of Murdoch's conglomerates has long been fodder for palace intrigue. As the 93-year-old conservative kingmaker, worth an estimated $20 billion, married, remarried four times, aged, and retired. Four of his children, Lachlan, James, Elizabeth, and Prudence, were set to gain control when he died. Murdoch telling Charlie Rose almost two decades ago. If I go under a bus tomorrow, yeah. Um, it'll be the, the four of them will have to decide. But much like in the HBO show, each child has reportedly been in and out of favor with their father over the years. What if I want to take over because I am the eldest son? Lachlan, once considered a long shot, now appears more aligned with his father's conservative politics, becoming the hand-picked heir. He's the CEO and chairman of Fox Corp and the chairman of News Corp. Neither company responded to our request for comment. Rupert's other children, more moderate politically, James just last week endorsing Kamala Harris for president. A representative for the attorney that's reportedly working for James, Elizabeth and Prudence declined to comment on the legal battle, citing a gag order. We did not hear back from Rupert's attorneys. It's likely that Rupert Murdoch and Lachlan will prevail, but if they don't, then you could see a big shift in not just the control, but also the politics of News Corp and Rupert Murdoch argues that would also damage the financial value of all those assets. Danny is joining us now. So high drama here and some media companies want the court to open up the proceedings. What are the chances that'll happen and we'll actually get a look at how this goes down? Low. And ordinarily, okay. courts are presumed open. It's difficult to seal a record and even more difficult to keep it sealed. But this is a situation in Nevada, thanks to a 2023 law and Nevada's push to become the state if you want to do your secret business dealings and have your trust there. And Nevada wants you to park your business in Nevada, and they've created legislation to help that. So if you're uh, playing the odds, it seems very unlikely okay. that they're going to be able to open up this particular particular case. Danny Savalos, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention your brief cameo in succession. I'm not going to tell people which season. You'll have to watch to find out. Danny, thank you very much. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.